Best. Good morning, Friendly Hills Church. Encourage you to make your way on into the sanctuary. We are going to begin. And we're going to begin with some announcements. Anyway, it's great to see you all. Great to have you here on a Sunday morning. It's always good to be in the house of, of the Lord together on the Lord's Day. As many of you know already, um, we have a, a group called First Glance. That is, if you're a visitor among us and wanted to try out our community group experience, you can do it in First Glance. So it's kind of like being able to kick the tires, drive the new car around the street sort of thing. So we would love to have you. I think it's pizza night. So it's a pretty good, pretty good uh, evening to try out First Glance on pizza night. Secondly, uh, we have just a reminder of Project Nothing. Okay, so last week, remember, I made an announcement that we were going to do the short-term mission in Fairmont, West Virginia. Okay, so scratch that. We're not going to do that. The staff was talking and said, wait, we have Project Nothing two weeks before that, and it's all the same stuff that we're gonna be doing up in West Virginia, why don't we just invite the whole church to be involved in Project Nothing? And so that's what we're gonna do. So the second week of July, Project Nothing, there's gonna be about 11 different projects that the youth will be doing, and you as a family or as an individual or as a group can sign up to be part of one of those projects, three of those projects, 10 of those projects, okay? You can do one or more. Now, here's what we're hoping will happen. We're hoping, especially for those of you uh, families with kids who wanna just sort of begin to find out what's out there and the, uh, a mission kind of thing that you can do together as a family that you go to one of these projects and you say, wow, this is awesome, this is for us. And you do it not just once a year, but you actually plug in maybe twice a month, once a month, and do it for the whole year. <clears throat> so that's what we're hoping happens out of Project Nothing. So there'll be more information about that. So again, we're not doing West Virginia, but we are doing Project Nothing. If you'd like to know a little bit more about it, there's a card out there on the table. Looks like this, has a QR code on the back. Snap a picture of it with your smartphone and you can find out a lot more about Project Nothing. All right, uh, May 20th, coming up, uh, we're having Kevin, Kevin Thumpston come and share with us or help us learn how to share our faith. Uh, notice it's called Questions of the Heart. And so everybody that you encounter has deep questions about who they are, about uh, the universe, about all kinds of things. And Kevin does, has a very good, helpful way to help you bridge those conversations with people and share the gospel with them. So that will be uh, in two weeks. Now, here's what's important. Next week is the last day to sign up. Okay, so a week from today, Mother's Day, will be the last day to sign up if you have kids. We are providing nursery, so if you want to be part of that and you have young kids, we'll provide nursery for you. Also, if you want a book, you're going to have to sign up because i got to let Kevin know, uh, and you'll, ha you'll get a book with that, and if you want lunch, okay, all of that will be provided by the church, but only if you sign up, okay? Otherwise, it's on you, which is fine. You can show up. We'd love to have you show up. But if you sign up, you get all the benefits. All right? So please sign up. Again, there's a QR code in the bulletin. You can do that. Also, coming up this summer is our sports VBS, and uh, registration is open. Please sign up quickly. The spots will fill quickly. So... If you have kids that you want to be part of the sports camp or you have re neighbors, friends in the neighborhood that you'd like to be part of the sports camp, sign up quickly. And then finally, just remember, women's summer Bible studies coming up. They'll be studying a place to belong and a great summer Bible study for you women. 
love to have you sign up for that as well. I'd like to <clears throat> invite, all right, who had the, oh, Brian Shear, yes, and the worship team. <clears throat> I didn't have it in my notes. So. The worship team will join us up on stage, and people of God, if you will stand for the call to worship as we worship our glorious God. Our call to worship today comes from Revelation 5, um, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your goodness, your power, your glory, your compassion, and your mercy. We thank you that we're able to gather together to worship you this morning. We pray that you would prepare our minds, our hearts, uh, to express our gratitude and love for you. We praise you uh, because of Christ's work on the cross that you have chosen to save us. Thank you, and in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please join me now as we sing together. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise the house in vain, its builders strive. To you who boast tomorrow's gain, tell me, what is your life? A mist that vanishes at dawn, all glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ, our King, all glory.
In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise Give me Jesus Give me Jesus Give me Jesus, you can have all this world, but give me Jesus. And when I am alone, oh, and when I am alone, and when I am alone, Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Give me Jesus. And when I come to die, and when I come to die, and when I come to die, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. I'd like to invite up Mike Gatton. We're coming to a time of uh, confessing our sins, and I want to draw our attention to Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 32, uh, to really give us a posture of our coming to confess to the Lord. And it says, And after this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him, Jesus. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with him. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so we are coming as sinners in need of a great physician. So Friendly Hills, let us confess our sins together using the confession you see on the screen. Lord Jesus, sin is my malady, my monster, my foe, my viper, born in my birth, alive in my life strong in my character, dominating my faculties, following me as a shadow, intermingling with my every thought, my chain that holds me captive, yet your compassions yearn over me, your heart hastens to my rescue, your love endured my curse, your mercy bore my justice, let me walk in humility, bathe in your blood, tender of conscience, living in triumph as an heir of salvation, through your blessed name, amen. Let's take a few moments to silently confess and receive the healing from the great physician.
Lord, we are people that are stained with sin, not only through our actions, but Lord, in our very nature. We are hostile to you, to your word, to what is right and good. We rebel. We are slothful in the heavenly race. God, we neglect what it is that you call us to. We forget your love and your care for us. So, Lord, now we take time to pause to acknowledge our sin, to name it specifically, to bring it to you, and to ask for healing, to ask for forgiveness, and to help us to cling to you, to follow you, and to enjoy the forgiveness that you give us through your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Friendly Hills, here the assurance of pardon from Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Amen. Let's turn our time uh, or turn our focus now to the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, We're looking at questions 62 and 64, and this goes perfectly well with what it is that we just confessed uh, as we are looking at a righteousness outside of ourselves because we have just acknowledged that we have no righteousness in and of ourselves. So I'll ask the question, uh, and you'll find the answer on the screen and in the bulletin. Question 62, but why can our good works not be our righteousness before God, or at least a part of it? Because the righteousness which can stand before God's judgment must be absolutely perfect and in complete agreement with the law of God. Whereas even our best works in this life are all imperfect and defiled with sin. But why do our good works earn nothing, even though God promises to reward them in this life and the next? This reward is not earned. It is a gift of grace. Does this teaching not make people careless and wicked? No, it is impossible that those grafted into Christ by true faith should not bring forth fruits of thankfulness. Please stand as we continue to worship together. Try 
trust is a deep, deep love of Jesus. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus far surpassing all the rest is an ocean full of blessing in the midst of every test oh the deep deep love of jesus mighty savior precious friend you will bring us home to glory where your love will have no end oh the deep deep love all i need and trust is the deep deep love of jesus you may be seated We have the wonderful privilege of welcoming into our body this morning uh, several people who have wanted to become members here at Friendly Hills Church. So if I could have John and Helen Gall join me, Isaac Harth, Emily Meeks, and uh, Matthew and Olivia Morganti. If you want to come up and join me on the stage here. Each of uh, these people have been through our inquirers class, um, have tried to, we've tried to communicate them to the best of our ability what the vision and hope and dream of Friendly Hills Church is, and they've wanted to become a part of that. So we're really grateful for that. And as part of that, they will uh, now confess uh, their faith before you. So we do that in a series of questions. Then do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure without hope, save his sovereign mercy? If so, say we do. And do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of sinners? And do you rest in him alone for your salvation as he is offered in the gospel? If so, say we do. And do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes a follower of Jesus Christ? If so, say we do. And do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? If so, say we do. And do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and its peace? If so, say we do. Amen. Well, let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for John and Helen, for Isaac, for Emily, for Matthew and Olivia. We thank you that they come desiring to be part of your body here at Friendly Hills Church, desiring to be uh, those who are able to carry out their service to you, Jesus, here. And so we pray that you will stir up the gifts in them, that you will uh, encourage their hearts, that you will bless them with a sense of your Holy Spirit, and that you will continue to help them grow in the nurture and admonition of you, Jesus, in their lives. We pray now, uh, bless our body to them and them to our body. We pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen. If you want to welcome our new members. All right. So if you all want to be seated, with the exception of the Morgantes, we have one more thing to do. So anyway, welcome, guys. <clears throat> this is uh, 
kind of similar to what happened with uh, the Philippian jailer. Remember, it says that he and his whole household were baptized when they became part of the church there in Philippi. And so Olivia and Matthew and Connor, you're looking good, Connor. You're still looking happy. That's good. I like that smile. So uh, it says that their whole household was baptized. And so Matthew and Olivia are joining us and Connor. And Connor's going to be baptized. So as we do this, uh, I was thinking about a promise found in Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, where Malachi says that I will send my messenger before your face, and he will draw the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, which is a powerful promise. Um, And... That's part of what covenant baptism means, is that we're asking God to fulfill that promise in this family so that Connor's heart is drawn to his father and mother and that his mother and father's heart is drawn to his. And in that exchange, he comes to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior early and young. So that's the promise of baptism That's the promise that's stated again in the New Testament in the context of baptism. That's our hope and joy. Or do you want to help out? That'd be great. Thanks. Thanks for volunteering. (laughs) All right. Come here, buddy. Come see me. Oops. Oh, looks like ice cream, doesn't it? Mmm, yummies. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Connor Michael Morganti. He is a very inquisitive young man, obviously. And he's coming among you as part of your covenant family. That not only are this his mom and dad, but you also will be his elders and fathers and brothers and sisters. You will be part of his family. Does it taste good? Not really. Okay, we'll try it again. (laughs) And so I'm going to ask Olivia and Matthew some questions here, and then I'm going to ask you, the congregation of Friendly Hills, some questions. So Matthew and Olivia, as cute as this little guy is, do you acknowledge that he's still a sinner in need of Jesus Christ and without hope save in his sovereign mercy, if so, say we do. And do you claim God's covenant promises on his behalf as you do your own, that you will come to rest in the salvation of Jesus Christ for him, if so, say we do. And do you now with unreserved hearts dedicate Little Connor to the Lord, and in humble reliance upon him and upon his Holy Spirit and the divine grace that God gives, that you will endeavor to set before him a godly example, that you will pray with him and for him, and that you will teach him all of the doctrines of our holy religion, and that you will in every way strive upon the mercy of God's appointment to bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If so, say we do. And you, the people of Friendly Hills Church, the members of this covenant family, do you promise to help Matthew and Olivia bring up little Connor in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? If so, say we do. do. I'm going to put this down for a second. Father God, I can't uh, think of a better picture of helplessness of, than Connor licking the microphone, uh, expecting uh, something better. Uh, we all come to you helpless, like a baby licking a microphone, but you 
pursue us, you love us, and you gave your own son for us. And so as Matthew and Olivia claim these promises on behalf of Connor, God, we ask that you continue to be who you are. You are God and you are good and you are faithful. And so will you be faithful in these promises that we claim that someday um, Connor will be a grandfather uh, and his faith will be passed down to his children and his children's children because of the faith of Matthew and Olivia. And God, again, we just thank you for life and we thank you that you are God and you are good. Amen. I'd like to invite Brian Shear to come forward again and uh, wait upon us, and also uh, worship team if you want to come back up as we continue our worship and giving our gifts to God. I'd like to invite the ushers and deacons helping with uh, offering to come forward, um, and please pray with me as we thank God for his providence. Lord, we um, acknowledge that everything in this world is yours, uh, that we are stewards of all that you have freely given to us. Uh, we thank you that you have uh, pointed to the birds and the flowers and how you provide for them and um, how much more will you provide for us. We pray that we would, like you, be um, generous with everything that you've given to us for the benefit of others and for the benefit of your kingdom and your glory. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, I rest me in the fire. And trees of skies and seas, his hands the wonder. Let's stand together as we continue singing. This is my father's world, the birds their carols raise, the morning light.
We're going to take a little bit, a little break from 1 Corinthians, and uh, Rich Walters is going to preach to us from 1 Peter chapter 1. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1, I'll be reading verses 1 through 9. First Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the, <clears throat> of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithany, Bithania, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ." Through, <clears throat> though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is God's word. Please be seated and join me in your hearts in prayer as I pray aloud. Father, you are the author and creator of our salvation and redemption. And not only are you the author and creator, but you are the finisher, the completer of our salvation. You have planned before time even started that you would build and create the earth, that you would inhabit it with human beings made in your image and that you would allow them to fall into sin by their own choice. And so now, Father, you have planned from the beginning of time to redeem many who have fallen and that you will continue to redeem and bring to life those whom you have chosen. And so now, Father, we pray that you will bless your people who are called by your name, that you will continue to spread the good news of Jesus, your son, who has purchased for us salvation from sin and death and the grave, that you will continue to raise up people from among us and from among the churches in our community and from the churches in our nation and the Christians to go out into all the world and preach the gospel baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we would ask as part of that, that you would pour your spirit out on our progeny, your blessings on our children, that they may flourish like grass in the meadows and like willows by the streams of water. In accordance with your everlasting covenant, we pray, Lord God, that you will let our descendants be great among the nations and our offspring ministers among the people. Let the nations be glad and know that we are a people blessed by the Lord. Let our children declare, I am the Lord's. Let them boldly inscribe your name on their hands and claim for themselves the name of the covenant God. For, Lord, that is our heart's desire. That is what we desire most from your hand, is that our children would carry not our name, but the name of the Lord down through the generations. We pray now, Lord, that you will continue to raise up our young people, 
that you will continue to inspire them and encourage them and bless them with a great knowledge of you. May you give them boldness and courage and strength. May they do greater works than we in all that, they're, in all that they carry out. We pray now that you will continue to bless and strengthen us for you have called us to such a great salvation. And we pray, Lord God, that you will bless Rich as he comes and lays out the beauty of this great salvation by which you have called us. For we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Children, if you want to be dismissed for children's worship, you can make your way over to the Christian Ed building, ages 5 through 3rd grade. If you're visiting among us, you're certainly welcome to go uh, let your kids go over, or you can keep them here. We love kids. And I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Reverend Rich Walters to come and to rightly divide the word of truth with us this morning. Now, <laughs> uh, glad I don't need the remarks that I prepared then to get things started. I've never used this before. This is new. I probably drip water on it. And <laughs> Let's pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. Be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Since the beginning of the year, the Joy Group here at Friendly Hills has been studying the first and second letters of Peter. Today, our text, as Nathan so graciously read, is taken from that first chapter of 1 Peter, verses 3 through 5. But before we start, I'd like to take a few minutes to set the scene. To whom was Peter writing? When was he writing? And most importantly, why was he writing to these people? Well, first we learn to whom he's writing in chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Peter, who is in Rome, is writing to these churches located in Western Asia. Today, they would be churches in Turkey. These churches are in the region where the Apostle Paul ministered. Paul, during his missionary journeys, had visited, preached the gospel, and planted churches in these five regions. So Peter is writing to churches, to Christians, 
who had learned of Jesus through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And I'm pausing here because I love that. I love the very fact that Peter would write as a loving shepherd, a loving Christian teacher, to people who had learned of Christ Jesus by his brother in faith, Paul's ministry. Where is Paul? Some say he's now in Spain. Others say he has left Rome and gone back into Eastern Europe. Others say he's still in Rome but under arrest. And there are some who believe that by this time Paul had died. I love the fact that Peter would write to his Christian brother Paul's flock and offer them direction, instruction, and encouragement to help them, to strengthen them during a time of need. So why was Peter writing? Why did Peter, why did these churches, these Christians need this direction, this instruction, this encouragement? Because the Christians in these churches are suffering. They're being tried. They're being tested. Verses 6 and 7 of 1 Peter 1 say, In this you rejoice, that's what we'll get to, what they're rejoicing in. But though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. These people are being persecuted. They are first generation Christians. We don't hear that too often. They're first generation Christians. Some have come from pagan families that were polytheistic, where numerous gods were recognized and worshipped. Others came from Jewish families and communities who saw Jesus as a condemned blasphemer who was crucified, not a savior. Now, the Christians to whom Paul is writing call Jesus Lord, Savior. They call him God. They are a small minority living among family and friends who live an entirely different life. A life with different values, different practices, different desires. As time progressed, the Christians are seen and treated as outsiders. As their faith grew and their lives changed as a result of their faith, they became resented and ultimately shunned and hated by their families and their friends. In verse 1 of this chapter, Peter referred to them as exiles of the dispersion. People being chased, mistreated, unwanted. People who were being persecuted because they believed and lived differently from their families and friends. I have a quote, normally I like to tell you who said it first. I didn't write it down, and when I looked back to find it the second time, I couldn't find it. But it's a great quote, so it's not my words, but it says what we're talking about. The world, people in general, who live outside of Christ Jesus, often show their lack of faith by hating, persecuting those of faith. That's why these people to whom Peter is writing need help, direction, 
encouragement. They need help in order to remain faithful, to live for Christ in a world where they are no longer welcomed. Peter's purpose in writing this first letter is to offer them, to show them, to instruct them, to encourage them in the way in which they are to live for Christ. And now we're drawing close to our text. But there's one more thing that I must pause and speak about. We are not persecuted as such. At least Christians in the United States, we are not persecuted as these people were. There are Christians throughout the world, however, who are being persecuted like this. We are not so threatened. We are not living yet in danger. But trials are coming. They're growing, even amongst us. Speak out against abortion in the name of Jesus Christ. Speak out against abortion from a biblical Christian point of view. See the response you receive from many. On the other hand, speak out that Jesus is the way. Jesus is the only way. He is the truth. He is the life. And watch how quickly your popularity fades and how many people turn aside. Now, it's not my purpose to start a political or social argument. Rather, my previous remarks were made to help us see that we also need to hear Peter's words that he wrote to the exiles of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And that brings us to our text. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last times. As Christians, we are born again to a living hope and inheritance imperishable. The recipients of Peter's letter, the Christians of the five regions of Asia, are tried in suffering. Peter's desire is to take their attention off their trials and put it on Christ's promises. A living hope, imperishable, incorruptible, an inheritance that does not fade away. Given by God's mercy to those who are in Christ Jesus. In verse verse 3, Peter wrote how this living hope was secured. By whom it was given and why it was given. The hope in which we live, the hope which we have for eternity has been obtained. It's been secured By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As Jesus conquered sin and death. Even so will those who trust in him. That's us. We have that hope. That as our savior. Conquered sin and death. So shall we. In him. Jesus' resurrection is the means of hope and grace and assurance. 
And this hope has been given to us by God the Father. Our living hope comes from God. Our hope for today and tomorrow and forever and for eternity is given to us by the grace and mercy of God. Not because of anything we have done. It comes as a gift through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If our resurrection, if our hope, excuse me, if our hope was because of something we did, something we earned, it would be temporal. It would be finite. It could be stolen. It could expire. It could ultimately fail or be lost. Peter wrote, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Can you see the importance, the necessity of a promise like this for this people? Exiles of the dispersion? A people whose lives are being tried. How great would be the news that though trials abound, God has given to us a hope that cannot be taken away and shall never fail. Peter then continues in verse 4, and he defines that living hope. Our living hope, he said, is an inheritance. An inheritance that is imperishable. This living hope is not subject to passing away. It has no expiration date. It's an inheritance also that's undefiled. Our eternal inheritance is not polluted by sin or evil. There is a marked contrast between life here and now and what God has promised for our eternal home. There, there will be no sin. There will be no evil. And then Peter said it's unfading. Grass withers. Flowers fade. But Peter wrote, the Christian's promised inheritance, the Christian's eternal home, will not fade or wither away. It will always reflect the beauty, the wonder, and the glory of God. This is the living hope that awaits all Christians It is kept for us who by God's power are guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. When we look to Christ, look not only at the salvation we have now here on earth, The blessings we receive daily from him. Remember just Friday. I left the office talking to Kelly and to Pastor Nathan. And just thought I had come from the joy group earlier that morning. We had studied the word of God. The sun was shining. And I just stopped along the pathway. And thought of the rich blessings. That have been given to me. That I did not earn. But yet God gave graciously. We on earth have the blessings from him. But remember Christ has also secured for us. An eternal inheritance. In our true homeland. John MacArthur wrote, Our eternal home is marked by righteousness, joy, peace, perfection. God's presence, the glorious companionship 
of Jesus Christ. And all else God has planned in the Christian's heavenly inheritance. As a boy, I can still remember, we used to sing, This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. It's not the angels beckoning these first generation Christians, but Peter writing to them to look ahead, to look above. Likewise, it's not an angel today calling you, but the very word of God written by his servant Peter, telling you, telling me, to always keep our hearts and minds on things above. It's not easy. It's not easy. There are many times we can be consumed, overwhelmed by earthly trials, earthly tests. But what God has promised is always, is always true and faithful. Peter wrote that our loving, that our living hope comes from the abundant mercy of God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus was raised from the dead 2,000 years ago gives us an unshakable conviction that our hope is is not in vain. Jesus' resurrection proves He is Lord of all creation who even now can make all things new. This living hope is our hope of salvation. We are born again, restored to fellowship with God. Our sins are forgiven. We are reconciled to the Lord Almighty. He has also given to us the promise of eternal life. The new life we have in Christ is something that can never be taken away. In fact, it will be greater when we reach our eternal home. The inheritance which we will fully experience when we see God face to face in that last time, can never be lost because God is keeping it for us and guarding it through faith. Peter did write that trials will come. They will continue. Read 2 Peter. The trials for these people did not get any lighter, but they got very greater as we read 2 Peter. But Peter also made it clear that this our hope, our living hope, will not and cannot be taken from us. Our hope as Christians is initiated by God. And he also keeps it secure through faith. God who grants us the ability to have faith. And once we exercise that faith, sustains and increases it. So that all who trust in Christ alone will never abandon the Savior. Or be abandoned by him. God gives to his own the faith they need. And they will confess Christ to the end of their lives. Will there be times of weakness? Yep. Times of hopelessness? 
trials, storms, <laughs> unfortunately, we're all going to experience them. But what Peter wrote and what we must understand, our real hope, our true and living hope, comes not from things in this world. Rather, it comes through Jesus Christ, living and abiding in Him and in His Word. The faith God gives to us as His people, that is our living hope. As I come to a close, I quote John Calvin at this point. I better be ready for that. 1 Peter begins with a description of our incorruptible and undefiled inheritance, which is our living hope, so that we may enjoy the invaluable treasure of a future life and also that we may not be broken down by present troubles but endure them, being satisfied with eternal happiness. Our living hope in Jesus Christ enables us to stand even in the midst of trials and storms. 100 years ago, Helen Lemmel wrote these words, and if you know me, you know there's going to be a hymn. I won't sing it for you. My home church in Philadelphia, I would have sung it, but I'll read it for you. O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see? There is light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory, his grace. Let's pray. Father God, it is not easy. There are trials and storms right here, right now. But you are with us. And your promise and your strength will never fail. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Invite James and the worship team. Please stand as we sing one final song together. It would have been perfect if we had sung Turn Your Eyes, but as was mentioned in this life, we need, we need Jesus as we look forward to our future living hope. In this life, we have to cry out, Lord, I need you so often. So please join me as we sing, Lord, I need you.
who guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Always good to be in God's house with God's people. If uh, please take the opportunity to greet our new uh, members here at Friendly Hills Church, welcome them, uh, shake their hand, get to know them, invite them out for lunch, whatever you want to do. Uh, I'm sure they'll appreciate you connecting with them. People of God, now receive this blessing from your God, this benediction. And now may the God of peace who brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good thing that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all of God's people said, amen. Go in peace.